I'm really excited to be able to talk about this. It's maybe a little bit different than some of the work that we've been talking about here at the conference and a little bit different work than what we've done in the past as well. I've, I generally spend a lot of time on, or in the past at least, I spent a lot of time on uh, big data systems like we've been talking about, but we've been pushing a little bit more into actually using the systems to do work ourselves as opposed to giving them to other people to do work. And one of the areas we got interested in is in sort of validating scientific claims. Uh, and so the overall goal here is to kind of take claims out of papers, check them against the repositories of open data, and kind of get an assessment of the overall health of uh, uh, different fields of science. So let me see if I can talk about what we're, what we're up to there. So I'll say a few words about reproducibility. Uh, there's, a, there's a longer talk that I and many others have, can give and have given on this, but I'm gonna try to keep it short in this uh, particular talk. I'll give you my, my new favorite example of this problem. So people are aware that there's a significant issue with, with reproducibility, uh, depending on who you talk to. So how many people are sort of aware of this problem in science? All right, how many people, okay, good. So people have heard of this. My new favorite example is actually an old example it's from 2006, but it's new to me where there was a study that showed, you can, you can read this and I'll try to describe it, showed that uh, <laughs> washing one's hands tended to make you less likely to be altruistic later and the hypothesis was that you somehow had a psychological feeling that you were uh, you know, washing away your sins and therefore you didn't really need to give back to the community anymore because you felt sort of clean. So this was in science, right? This is not in some third tier journal. Uh, there's a, site that does manual reproducibility of, manually reproduces claims in, in, in papers, and we're gonna try to automate some of this, some of this stuff, and this is the report for this claim. The top block there is the original claim. Uh, let me see if I can point here. Actually, let me try to use this guy. So this is the, uh, original claim, and these are reproducibil re uh, studies that were attempted to reproduce the result. Here is the original effect size in the paper, and here is the reproduced effect size. That's not great news for, for, this, for this particular claim. Um, and then there's the pool. And then this is a modification of that uh, claim, or, or a, a corollary for, a, I don't know what a corollary for a false thing is, but a, that, that the more, that the, uh, let's see, Let's see, the, the moral purity threat uh, boosts the need to clean oneself. So you're more likely to wash your hands if you feel like you've committed sins lately. And here's the original effect and here's the sort of reproducible effect. So again, not great news. The error bar surrounds zero. Uh, and then there's a third version here. So one is this example's sort of compelling as the kind of thing that maybe we should try to avoid upstream in the, in the process. But also these kinds of reports I want you to keep in mind because that's the kind of thing we're gonna try to, we're gonna try to generate automatically. Okay, so that's one particular example, but who cares? You know, maybe, maybe it's, easy to, it's easy to cherry pick sort of uh, funny examples, but there's a paper in Science in 2015 that did sort of a, a wide reproducibility study, and the, you know, here's the original effect size in the paper, and here's the replicated effect size, and so the green dots are okay, and the red dots are not so okay, uh, and so there seems to be some sort of significant problem here. And if you don't believe any of the quantitative arguments, you can just ask a bunch of people, hey, is there a reproducibility crisis? And, you know, 52% of people say, yes, a significant crisis, which seems a little redundant, and 38% say a slight crisis, which seems a little bit oxymoronic. But regardless, lots of people sort of agree that there's a bit of a problem going on here. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot more to say about this and what's going on and what we can maybe do about it. And there's been papers written on, you know, ranging from let's change the p-value from 0 0.05 to 0 0.005. And there's actually a pretty cogent argument as to why that is a good idea, but it's not clear to me that that's really going to solve the problem. That's sort of like recommending people to buy bigger computers if your if you're, if you're, uh, algorithm is too slow. Uh, but the, the, the thing I'm most worried about and the thing that sort of motivates what we think about in this space is that uh, a lot of the efforts to fix reproducibility tend to reduce to... Um, some form of standards, right? Better hygiene upstream. Let's Let's convince scientists to change their behavior and do a better job of, of tracking their data and managing the data and attaching metadata and using a different kind of you know, managed environment that will help automate these things. And I don't really think any of those approaches have shown, been shown to be very successful and I don't think they ever can be very successful. And the reason is, uh, besides the fact that asking some very smart, stubborn people to change their behavior is probably a, a difficult thing to do, uh, 
regardless, you know, th there's something fundamentally wrong about that approach, right? So I claim that any kind of metadata standard or schema or ontology or, or even process standard uh, it represents some kind of shared consensus about the world. But at the frontier of research, that shared consensus doesn't exist by definition. If we understand it so well that we can all standardize it, it's not going to be uh, as, as much of an object of study. And, this, and the scientific frontier, what we sort of fund and what we pursue is, is designed to be pushing that envelope. Okay. And further, any consensus that does emerge will sort of change frequently, again, by definition. And I, I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a database guy, and I, as a grad student, I got invited to a o oceanography metadata standards kind of meeting, and I was really excited because I was like, oh, I'm a schema guy, I'll go talk to him about schemas, and everyone else will be talking about schemas, and this is great. And, you know, there was a lot of debates around what, what units to use for salinity and what, how do we describe different sensors and how do we design the, you know, XML was hot at the time, right? So XML, what sort of dialect of XML should we use to sort of handle all possible sensors that were coming online. And it was fine, and I sort of learned a lot and so forth. And I got invited to another meeting uh, seven or eight years later, and I swear it was the exact same meeting, right? The exact same issues were being brought up, the exact same topics were being done. It wasn't really XML anymore, but they're just, ha they're, to ask a bunch of people to say, step one, you know, everyone agree on the terms we're going to call everything, and then step two, we'll go build some tools for you. Uh, that step one is a doozy, right? It's, it's, it's not clear it's going to happen, okay? Fine. So, and then maybe this last point is that even for sensors and experiments nowadays, you know, people are, people are incentivized to design new sensors from scratch, and so somehow, of course, that won't be subject to a standard because it does something nothing else can do. And one example here was a, a flow cytometer. Do people know what these things are? So these were developed for medical applications originally, and you put it on a bench and you put plasma or something in the back end, and, and it pushes particulate matter through a capillary and shines lasers at it, and by the absorption and refraction patterns of the laser light, you can tell what kind of, what kind of particle it is. Uh, and so it's for diagnostic things, for, you know, what, what, what are the pathogens in this, in this sample. But we had an oceanography lab, uh, you know, they had a Cracker Jack microfluidics engineer on the team, and they built, a, built one of their own from the ground up, turned it upside down, and put it on the bottom of ocean-going vessels, and now they're getting a real-time, you know, painting out a line of the micro biology population in the open ocean. And so we said, okay, well, what do you want to do with this data? And they were like, we have no idea. No one's ever seen this data before. But this kind of time varying, high density, high volume census of the, of the, of the microbiology po populations was not something that's going to be subject to a data standard that's already been uh, published. Okay, so I think I've belabored that enough. So that's the bad news. The good news, though, is that uh, Science is increasingly being pooled in public repositories. There's been significant investments from sponsors and funding agencies, as well as partnerships with journals to say, if you publish a paper in our journal, you must also submit your data uh, into this public repository. And these things have sort of worked in the sense that, that data is being accreted. Uh, so some of the work that we're trying to do, it simply wouldn't be possible be without these things. So if the, if the data remains squirreled away on people's individual laptops, there's no way we even have access to it. We can't even put our arms around it, so there's no way we can sort of attack this problem uh, at all. Okay. But uh, some people in the room might have opinions about this, and I'm kind, of, I'm kind of rehearsing this argument to see if you have other examples to do. But I, I think that one end of the spectrum here emphasizes flexibility, right? So Figshare, for example, uh, all you do, all, all, the only service, you upload whatever you want and you give it a little free text metadata and you get back a DOI and they promise to sort of hold it forever. And there's a few other little services, but essentially it's kind of whatever you want. On the other end of the spectrum, perhaps it was this project called CA Big that some people may be familiar with. So this was a, a bit of a boondoggle. And by a bit, I mean a huge boondoggle. It, it's, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars spent and approximately zero data sets ever went into the thing. And there's been a number of papers published about, you know, there were essentially autopsies on what happened with this project. And the consensus is that, uh, or one of, the, one of the arguments is that, uh, you know, data is just too hard to get in and too hard to get out because there were sort of ontologies and metadata standards and so forth and everybody had to agree on everything. And everybody said, forget this, I'll just, you know, email, I'll just send everything as email attachments to my collaborators like I was doing 10 years before that. Okay. so. What we, what we want to do is say, look, it's not up to uh, stop putting pressure on the people using the system and put a little bit more smarts into the system. So the experience you have is more like the left-hand side of this, but perhaps the services you get are perhaps more like the right-hand side of this. And we're just trying to explore this, explore this space a little better. Unless you think this is only sort of life sciences or 
you know, it's sort of the, the library information science community. There are, you know, there's, there's a r3data.org kind of tracks science data repositories and there's thousands of these things coming online. So there's, there's, there's work to do. All right, so for most of the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus on gene expression data, which admittedly is a little bit of an easy case because there's only so many devices that produce these things. There's only so many different ways of collecting this data. There's essentially microarray and RNA-seq and we're gonna mostly talk about microarray. So this is almost, you know, we haven't delivered on the full vision of this if, if we can only do it with gene expression data, but if we can't do it with gene expression data, then probably we're, we're in trouble, okay. Um, so f as a, I'm not qualified to give a one slide overview of microarray, but I'm going to do it anyway. There's, uh, you, you attach these DNA probes. How many people know what microarray data is and know roughly how it works? That's pretty good, maybe, uh, maybe I'll be quick. Attach these DNA probes to a chip. This is a, you know, a chip you just buy, they're, they're standardized. Uh, then you splash your sample over these, uh, over this chip. Uh, it's in the machine, so, it's, so all the DNA gets replicated, and you can tell how much of each of these genes was in your uh, sample by how, how, how much amplification you get in that, in that process. So the green, green dots, you end up getting an image, and the green dots means that, that gene sample was present, or that, that probe was present, and the red means it's, it's, it's less highly expressed. And again, people in the room probably are wincing at that, but bear with me. All right, so I said the good news was lots of public data available. This is the increase in number of data sets uh, in the GEO repository, submitted data sets in the GEO repository. GEO is the Gene Expression Omnibus. Um, the bad news, let me ignore this top one for a second. The, the, uh, Bad news is that um, the number of samples used, so this is a particular kind of, of uh, microarray chip, the number of samples available is this red line, the number of samples used is this blue line. By available, I mean uh, relevant to some study, by some, you'll trust me that that's a, that's a reasonable definition of, of, of available. So it's not saying that all possible data sets are, are useful for all possible studies, that's not the case. Uh, but by a reasonable measure, there's a lot of data sets available, but people are saying, people are, are, are end up using about two data sets per, per paper regardless. So, the, so in some sense, the value proposition of these big repositories isn't quite being realized, right? It's going up and up and up and up, but people are kind of piddling along using about the same amount. There's a whole set of other plots we do about this where you can show that, uh, you know, that the, the rich keep getting richer, that the very popular data sets are used by everybody, and there's a long tail where they aren't touched at all. Maybe that's fine because they're not very important data sets, but also maybe it's because of the technical friction in trying to get access to these data as a pain, so you just use the convenient, convenient ones. And so I'm a little bit worried about the, uh, you know, uh, con convenient samples of everybody sort of studying the same five data sets because they're just the ones that are, that are, that are well described. So there's all kinds of effects you can sort of think about here, and we're not, we're not done motivating it, but we are kind of realizing that uh, even though the data is there, it's not really being used in the way that we, that we expected. Um, so this is a slightly different way of saying the same kind of argument. This is uh, all data available in the repository versus referenced in some paper, right? So there's a lot of data in the repository that's not being referenced by, by uh, any paper except for the one who uh, uploaded it. And in fact, in the process of trying to make this plot and figure this out and try to understand how this stuff is being used, my student discovered that uh, the number of data sets in the repository uh, well, let's see, the number, there were, there were references to data sets that could not be seen in the repository, which shouldn't make any sense, right? If you, if you have an identifier, it must have gotten that identifier from the repository, so it has to be in there in some form. So what happened was uh, there, uh, the, the workflow here is, you know, you upload the data and then you uh, submit the paper, and then once the paper is accepted, you're supposed to go back and make the, make the data set public, and lots and lots and lots of people were not doing that. And so we had this, so we had this long list of, like, things that were supposed to be public but were not you know, by, by their own rules, we're supposed to be public. And we have this plot where it's sort of that, that number just creeps up over, over 10 years, goes higher and higher and higher and higher. And then when we send an email to the repository owners, it dropped like a rock in, in like two-week period because they just went and flipped the bid on a whole bunch of data. So we felt like sort of data liberators and we get gener gen generated a little bit of press from that and nature called us up and so forth, so that was fun. Okay, so what is the problem here? Uh, there's other arguments to make, but I just want to simplify it as this. The, the, essentially, the curation is bad. And one example you can give is just the only, the only service they provide over this thing is kind of bad keyword search, right? So there's no magic 
integration stuff or no statistical machinery or anything. It's just a big pool of data with, with keyword search. And even the keyword search doesn't work properly, right? It's, it's the, you know, you search for, give me all the liver data sets and the precision recall is, is, is atrocious, okay? So it's, so it's, you know, and this is even before we get into the fact that the schema of the data set has funny labels like class one and class two as opposed to smoker and non-smoker or anything kind of semantic, right? There's, there's a, so it's a lot of, it's not, it's, I don't think it's too controversial to claim it's a lot of work to try to go find relevant data sets and use them in your study, okay? Um, and part of, the, part of the conventional approach to this problem is to again kind of blame the researchers, put the responsibility on them. This is from the actual submission guide for Array Express that says, hey, you know, stop doing the top thing where you just write your free text and start doing this bottom thing where you put it into structured columns. The fact that we're, that, you know, th this should not be a problem that, let's see. We have algorithms and methods that, that are not too afraid of this kind of a step. The fact that we're asking humans to kind of do this kind of structuralization uh, doesn't really seem to be worth their time in my mind. So I kind of want them to be able to upload whatever the hell they want, free text, and we can do whatever we need to do uh, to, to provide higher level services on this stuff. All right, so I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, one thing you can do is look at the gene expression data itself and train a classifier to recognize whether, whether it's male or female or smoker or non-smoker or lots of, or they have one disease or they, or, they, or they don't, what cell type it is, whether it's liver or kidney or something, right? That's kind of a nice luxury we have in this gene expression example because all that, all that information is potentially encoded in the gene expression data itself. So instead of relying on the human to tell us that it's liver, we can sort of figure out that it's liver. This works, this was a paper that these, these folks uh, approached, but they, um, but, it's, but it's fully supervised. You need a big set of training data that, that, that is, is properly labeled. And I'll make another sort of bold claim. I, I don't think supervised learning, I think supervised learning is fundamentally incompatible with science as well. And the reason is uh, tr training data is expensive and requires subject matter expertise. And at the forward edge of science, you don't have money and you don't have uh, you have busy people with, the only people that have the subject matter expertise are busy people. You can't crowdsource, hey, what is this gene expression data set? You know, tell me if this is liver or kidney, right? There's nobody out there on, on Amazon Turk that can, that can tell you the answer to this, right? Uh, it's not cats on the internet, right? Um, the, moreover, the class labels, the ontology and the lexicon, they're not stable as I argued before, right? It's changing all the time. There's not a lot of disagreement and so forth. So if you want to change the ontology, you've now, uh, made your previous training data set that was so expensive to, com to create obsolete and you have to go train a bunch of new data, right? If they have a new, op if, the, if, the, if the people who are labeling the data have a new option available to the ontology, the entire work they spent labeling the old one is, is, is no longer any good, okay? Moreover, different communities may have different ontologies and they may want to train things separately. There's not just one training set you need, right? We all kind of agree on what a cat is, but if different communities di di disagree, you need two ontologies, which now means you need two, da two training data sets. Okay, and then also it just sort of contains errors and it's hard to prove that it's perfect. And so, I, you know, I wince every time I hear the word ground truth anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm influenced by other people who were wincing and I asked them why and they explained it and I started wincing too. But ground truth doesn't really exist in a lot of these, a lot of these spaces. Okay, so we think about this notion of, you know, the, the game in, to get things published in machine learning conferences is to, you know, get the right little nuance of a, of a new term or something. So we, we're, we're experimenting with this term organic supervision. Uh, but the idea is pretty simple. It's give me a lexicon of labels. You gotta give me some, some kind of set of labels. You can call it an ontology or whatever you want. We call it a lexicon. And then you get a set of data items where, the da where there's a pair, the data and the text. Um, and I'll explain how we use this in a second, but that's all we're sort of given. And then the task is to assign a label from the lexicon to this, to this pair, okay. But we're not gonna do, any, there's no training data, there's no supervision, there's no anything. We're just gonna take this as input. And this is, we're not sure how often this comes up, but it seems to come up often enough that we're kind of excited. So data sets and text descriptions and assigned repository is what we're talking about. We've also done a lot of work on this. We have this notion of visiometrics, which is kind of mining the scientific literature to understand how figures are used and uh, how people use visualization to communicate. And we turned this thing, what I'll describe, loose on, on that problem using the figures as the data and the captions as the text. And that worked quite well. We're thinking about doing this with photos and news stories. Uh, we got a little bit of work going on with art and just the description of art and so on, okay. So anytime you have this kind of link between the data and the text, you, you potentially can use this approach. So what's it look like here? Uh, there's, 
these three inputs, the ontology, the expression data, and then this free text, just type whatever you want. Uh, and then there's two classifiers that kind of do this dueling pianos thing, where you initialize with what's called distance supervision, but that's just look for exact matches. If, if, the, if the term in the ontology literally appears verbatim in the free text metadata, then label it as such. That's a bad, you can, you can use that as your classifier. That's a bad classifier though, because it's, it's pretty noisy and you get a lot of labels and you don't really know which one's which and uh, all kinds of problems. But then you pass that as, a, as an initial, uh, uh, initial training set to this data classifier uh, that will learn a signal from this big vic vector uh, and then pass those labels back to the tech, back to a, actually a different text classifier and so on. And you iterate until this thing converges. Does this make sense? So co-learning does something similar, but doesn't really initialize with text and doesn't assume very much about the noisy sources, which turns out to require a lot of tricks. And then things like distance supervision is a, is a term of art that it does sort of handle noisy sources, but doesn't really try to do this iteration thing. So we kind of, after talking to all the people, we kind of realized that a reasonable way to think about this is distance supervision plus co-learning. And then they, then they weren't so agitated. Once we called it the right thing, they weren't so agitated about the fact that it worked so well. So yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, no, although we do, if you give us a hierarchy, we can take advantage of that in one way that I'll describe, but if you don't, that's okay too, it'll, it'll just sort of work, yeah. Well, n no, uh, we're giving it a label. So it's not, so unsupervised would be sort of what you described. It's essentially clustering and we don't know what, what to call these things. This is producing a labeled, e each item is given a label. Um, and then maybe, maybe what's also in your question is, well, how do you evaluate this thing or how, or how is it useful after that? Well, that evaluation, you have to do the, you have to do the standard way. You have to have a, you know, we have to have some sort of gold standard uh, and then compare how well we do with that. And we do, we do quite well. Right. Uh, I'm conscious that I'm now getting a battery even though it's plugged in, so that plug must not work. So that's the game. This is the you know geo example. This is kind of more abstracted, just as a cartoon, so you can kind of see what's going on. But we need these pairs, data and text, uh, and then pass into these dueling pianos. And then how how the information is exchanged is kind of part of the part of the trickery here. And that's where we can take advantage of hierarchical relationships or take advantage of other tricks and so forth. So there's a lot of details here, but roughly the idea is pretty pretty simple. So for the tissue annotation problem, again, the data <coughs> are these are these gene expression images. And the text description is just the things that are provided by the scientists. I claim that it's not too much to ask them to put some free text and describe what they're doing. They seem to be already doing that, and I think it's probably reasonable to ask them to do that in almost any context. I think what becomes unreasonable is start to say, you have to fit it to our schema or do our thing. And not only because we want to protect the time of the scientists, although I do kind of think that, also because why do you think your scheme is so great, right? Why is, why is that one schema that you're asking them to fit it into the right one forever? It seems like just let them write whatever the hell it is in their best work. They're, they're the experts, right? So let, you write, you describe it however you want and then we'll try to adapt it for our task uh, post hoc. You know, clean, clean it up in post or something. Okay. And then for the figure comprehension problem, uh, you know, these are just figures out of papers and can we recognize is it a scatter plot or is it a, you know, diagram or is it something else? And I'll say a couple words about this because I'm pretty, I'm, we're pretty excited about this project overall. It's kind of a fun sociological bibliometric, we sort of, it's a pun on bibliometrics except instead of understanding the citation graph, we look at the figures. Um, but you know, in the caption, probably very few of us actually say this is a scatter plot of, you know, something, right? That's not usually how you describe your figures. But a few people do. And as long as there's a few people that do sort of have the right term in there, this little gadget will sort of pick up on that and start to recognize what a scatter plot looks like, and also, also as a side effect, some synonyms for the word scatter plot in the text classifier. Does that make sense? So the overall effect here, the, the first, the first version of this visiometric stuff, 
was supervised learning and we had a student sort of, you know, chained to a desk and would sort of sit there and label things as like, oh, this is a plot, this is a diagram, this is a so-and-so, this is a so-and-so, you know, 2,000, 2000 labels later. But it was kind of hokey, it was a lot of work, but also it was kind of hokey because it was these very coarse categories, right? Plot and diagram and so forth. And we did some interesting things with that and showed that photos are going down over time and plots are, 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 are increasingly associated with citation counts. And so you, you know, there's some kind of correlation there between scientific impact and visual expression of things. I mean, really interesting stuff. But that, those coarse categories were pretty sad. So now we don't have to do that. Now we can just, if you have a, if you have a type of visualization you want to look for, just throw it in the ontology Run the run the thing again overnight, and you and then you get a high quality list of those, a high, you know, a pr pretty good list of those that type of visualization. Okay, uh, so that sort of makes sense. I'm not going to talk too much more about the Visio metrics, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. All right. So as a recipe, I've already kind of described this, but but uh, just as a in in English, you know, initialize with distance supervision, and what I mean by that is if the term C literally appears in the text verbatim, assign as a label train a classifier on the data using those current text labels, and then classify everything using that new classifier. Then train a classifier uh, on the text using the labels from step two and classify all, the uh, classify all the text descriptions using G, and then go to step two. And so you have this kind of two sets of labels uh, emerging. And, okay, that's the simplified version. One thing is you have to figure out how to combine labels from the two classifiers. One is, uh, Ignore everything and just always use the exact matches. That still actually works pretty well because these things still still learn from learn from themselves over each iteration. Uh, another is only use the image classifiers and ignore or uh, the, the image labels on each iteration and ignore the text labels. You can take the union of all those labels. You can take the intersection of those labels, and this is the trick that uses the hierarchy in the ontology. You know, if, 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 if two labels are suggested and one is more specific than the other, throw out the more general one. Okay, so, and you can play games with this and try, try other things. And, okay. So let me just show you the results real quick. So this was uh, 100,000 or so expression samples, big 20,000 dimensional vectors, each, you know, each one of these, it's, a, it's an image. Uh, a really large ontology, which, which turns out to be problem, problematic for many of these machine learning methods. So this is 5,000 possible tissue labels in a complex ontology. It's not six different categories or something, right? Which, which almost any method can do well at. Um, one thing that, that, you know, some of the, a couple of reviewers dinged us on early was, oh, you know, this is an easy task because almost all your sample, you know, you got lucky because people actually mentioned blood in the, in the text and you're trying to label it as blood. Most, most of these cases you're trying to handle wouldn't have that property. And I'll show you a result in a second that shows why they were wrong. So, uh, and then scientific classification, we did this 1.2 million images, a, a, much, a much smaller ontology, but here it's growing because we're kind of making up, there is no visualization ontology of all visualization types. We're kind of making it up as we go, but that's okay because we can just throw them in there and rerun the thing and it, and it seems to work. Oops. Uh, okay, and then, and then in this case, sorry, to, somebody's taking a picture and I just tricked you. Um, so in this case, though, it's much worse. Only 10% of the samples, like, like uh, this is the point I was making earlier, where we don't, we don't write in our caption, this is a scatter plot, right? Uh, so very few, only 10% of those actually have explicit mentions in the ontology. It's much better in the gene ex expression case. So these are kind of two interesting applications that have different properties and works pretty well for both. Um, so the classifiers are nothing fancy here. This is just logistic regression on that big, on that big, High, high image vector you could do. We started off doing some deep learning stuff, but it's just not, it's not really necessary. It just takes a lot longer to compute. I'm sure eventually some deep thing will be, will outperform it, but it's, um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I, I actually, I lied about that. We actually do use pre-trained ResNet 50 for classifying images. We basically we don't care too much about the details of the classifier. We can use whatever you want. Uh, we're more, more interested in the, in the method. And then uh, for the text classifier, this fast text thing from Facebook is really, Pretty neat. It's uh, well. Anyway, you can read about it, but it's but it's it's it works a lot faster than some. It com competes with a lot of the learned vector embedding kind of methods, but it works a lot faster. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me let me see if I can make this point kind of quick. Uh, the the URL this this paper that I showed earlier, just the you know the front the first page of the paper who were the first folks to say, oh, we can train a classifier in the expression data and use that to help curate them, you know, assign metadata labels, but they did it in a supervised way. The other thing we didn't love about this paper was they, um, they had really, really high accuracy and so forth, but we couldn't quite figure out how they were measuring accuracy exactly. 
Um, and we couldn't imagine that they were doing what we thought they were doing. And after a bunch of email exchanges, they were indeed doing what we thought, we thought they were doing, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'll try to explain why. So what, what they were doing was uh, if, you pick, if, they assign, if they assign a label of, uh, let's see. So the correct label here is, is leukocyte. And if the uh, predicted label uh, was, let's see, uh, let, me, let me say it this way. If um, the correct label was anywhere in the up path from the, from the predicted label, they gave themselves full credit for that. And so what this reduces to is essentially a six-way classifier, because all you have to do is guess the top level, the most general term, and you'll still get full credit for it. You, you don't get any more credit for being more specific, which doesn't really make intuitive sense. Like, we want to we sort of be aggressive about guessing the most specific thing and then hopefully try to do balance it right. So by that goofy measure, we also do really well, as, as, as would any, almost any method. Uh, but a better measure here is to do what we call sort of this up precision, up recall. So this is take the path from the root to the prediction and take the path from the root to the correct label and just take their precision recall of the, of the set implied there. Does that make sense? So like if you, if, you, if you overlap heavily and then only branch off at the bottom, you'll get, you'll, get some, you'll get credit for that. If you pick a more specific term, you'll get credit for that. If you're way off and you're just in a completely different region of the ontology, you won't get any credit for that. We don't count the root, I guess, because the root everybody connects to. Anyway, so by this measure, we, we blow their doors off even though, they're, even though they're supervised, which is sort of remarkable. So, in fact, here's that. Here's one of these. This is area under the or under the precision recall. Whoops, area under the precision recall curve. So they were given 15,000 labeled samples, and that's a resource that we don't need or have access to. And they do down here. CoEM alone, which is just the iterative component, without some of the trickery we do around distance supervision and, and so forth, um, includes the original. It also also requires the labeled data, but then it can also take advantage of the unlabeled data in in kind of a smart way. Uh, somewhat annoyingly, distance supervision does pretty well on its own, which it kind of shouldn't. <laughs> uh, and then us, we, we do better than this, and we have no we have no no input whatsoever, no no labeled input whatsoever. Okay, and also this is area under the PR curve. This is not accuracy, so so a little bit of change in this actually is actually can be a, can be a pretty big deal. And so just to put that in a picture, um, you know where this we're this big bar <laughs> and you're looking for the area under this. The reason why some of these other ones are small is because you can't, you can't really paint out a PR curve with distance supervision because it doesn't really have that, uh, it doesn't require any uh, training data so you can't, you can't change the size of that to paint out this curve but you can't put a point on the plot. Okay, so anyway, so it's, it's significantly, so this is gene expression and, and figure annotation and it does a lot better than the state of the art without the training data which is pretty, we thought was pretty remarkable. Okay. Um, we also learn new classes with new data, and what I mean by that is uh, there's no way that these supervised methods can assign a label to something if that label did not also appear in the training data somewhere, right? So if you have something in your ontology that was never, never, never selected as, a, as part of the training data, you'll never learn anything there. There's zero signal for that label. We're, we, we can, right? If you just give us new data tomorrow and it mentions a few extra, a few new terms that we haven't seen before. Uh, and they're and they're there in the ontology. It'll pick them up. Okay. Uh, 